Welcome everyone to the Montreal launch of A Natural History of Transition by Carolyn Angus. Um, my name is Ashley Fortier and I am the co-publisher of Metonymy Press here in Montreal. Uh, we're very excited to be uh, co-hosting this event with the Blue Metropolis International Literary Festival. Um, so I'm just going to get started here. Um, we're broadcasting today from Jajage, which is located on the territory of the Gania Gahaga. Uh, Jajage has been and continues to be a meeting place for other Indigenous peoples as well. Uh, we do uh, also want to recognize the limitations of territorial acknowledgements like this one. Um, we therefore strive um, as a press to actively support struggles for decolonization and Indigenous resistance, um, both here locally and elsewhere. Um, we encourage settler audience members to seek out opportunities for self-education and solidarity as well. Um, this event is being live captioned. Thank you to Kay Pettigrew for doing the live captions. Uh, if you don't see captions on your Zoom screen right now and would like to see them, you should have an option to turn them on. Um, the closed captioning button, is, if you're on full screen, should be available on your bottom menu or sometimes it's on the top, but you should be able to tog it, toggle it on or off. Um, we are also recording this event. Uh, so just letting you know that in terms of, um, I guess, your engagement through questions and and uh, and the chat because you're obviously not on screen. Um, we were meant to be broadcasting to Facebook Live, but we're having issues, so that's not currently happening. Um, like I said, I want to thank the Blue Met Festival for including us uh, in their program. We're really excited to have this opportunity and this platform. If you want to find out more about the program for the Sears Festival, which goes on to the end of this weekend, uh, you can visit bluemetropolis.org and I will put that link in the chat in a little bit. Um, be sure also to check out the upcoming launch. I have a bunch of um, literary walking tours that are brought, uh, launching on May 20th um, by, uh, I think they're done as podcasts um, on account of the COVID. Um, but there's one in particular called um, Tensions and Intersections uh, Circuit Littéraire du Village Gay um, with uh, appearances from a number of local trans, queer and trans authors, including um, some of Metonymy's own. So check that out also on the Blue Metropolis website. Um, for those who don't know, Metonymy Press is a small queer feminist uh, press based here uh, in Jojage, Montreal. Um, a Natural History of Transition is our 10th publication. I'm very excited about that. Um, it's been about almost exactly six years since we launched our first book um, by my co-publisher, um, Oliver Fugler. And um, yeah, if you are interested, in, if you're an emerging writer and you're interested in submitting to us, uh, reach out. Our website is metonymypress.com and we've got a um, fair bit of social media pres presence if you want to get in touch that way. Um, we are going to have a question and answer from audience members later on in the event. Um, but uh, I first want to um, introduce our two panelists tonight. Um, we're very lucky to have Cal in conversation with um, Helen Chow Bradley, who is a Montreal author and whose work we're also going to be publishing this fall. So um, Helen is a writer, musician, and arts administrator uh, living in Chajage, Montreal. They are the author of Automatic Object Lessons, uh, which was put out last year by another great small press called House House. Their stories and essays have appeared in Carte Blanche, Cosmonauts Avenue, Entropy Magazine, Maisonneuve Magazine, uh, Montreal Review Books and elsewhere. And as I said, Personal Attention Role Play, which is their collection of short stories will be published by Metonymy in um, October. 2021. So thank you, Helen, for being here tonight. Um, 
I'm going to introduce, so we're going to get to hear from Helen's forthcoming collection, and then we're going to hear from Cal's uh, book, A Natural History of Transition, but I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to read Cal's bio now, and then I'm going to turn things over to Helen and um, disappear from the screen. So uh, Cal M. Angus is a trans writer and editor currently based in Portland, Oregon. His work has appeared in Nat Root, West Branch, LA Review of Books, Catapult, The Commons, Seventh Wave Magazine, and elsewhere. He's received support from Lambda Literary and Signal Fire Foundation for the Arts, and he holds an MFA from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. He's also the founding editor of an exciting online journal called Smoke and Mold. Um, I'm not going to say too, too much about the book. I think probably a lot of people have a lot of excitement around it. I've heard of it. We're going to hear some great questions from Helen, but just as a by way of intro, um, the, like the landscape studied over eons, change does not have an expiration date for the trans characters in Cal's book, A Natural History of Transition. They grow as tall as buildings, they turn into mountains, they give birth to cocoons, uh, they do a lot of other pretty magical things. So um, we are absolutely thrilled, honored to be launching this book. We wish we could all be doing it IRL. It's like, I sound like a broken record saying that. We all wish we could be together, but uh, next best thing to, uh, to have you all here from all over. So thanks for being here and bye for now. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, yes, I'm gonna read a just the beginning of a story that will be in personal attention role play. The story is called Soft Shoulder. Oops. Soft Shoulder, out of Montreal. The van was packed full belly riding low over the asphalt. Each pothole on the way out of the city jolted the drum stands, punctuating our caffeinated chatter with staccato clangs. Taylor, travel mug in one hand, merged us onto the 15, which was pitted and sagging and in even worse shape than it had been on our last tour. We were impressively only two hours behind schedule. Imagine we get a flat before we even cross the border, Sarita said bracing herself in the passenger seat. Maybe we should have replaced the spare after all. Logan let out a small alarmed noise, but we laughed. Hecate's approach to touring was to expect the worst and to have as much fun as possible before the worst arrived. We weren't planners, we worked with chaos. We did it for the transcendent moments, those flashes when the sweat and the feedback and the lights and the crush of bodies collided in a hot burst. But between those fleeting crests, it was mostly loading gear up and down unventilated stairwells, getting misgendered and patronized during sound check, rinsing out our sour underwear in some punk house's grimy sink, pissing in slurpy containers and tossing them out the window as the van accelerated finally up the ramp to the eternal highway, where nothing but gridlock, entropy, and endless tolls awaited. This tour would be charmed though. Hope pulsed through us despite our attachment to pessimism. For the first time we had touring visas and we rolled through the border at Lake Champlain with the confidence of the ordained. Gone were the days of covering our tattoos, flashing perky smiles and pretending we were driving down to New York for a girl's shopping trip, OMG, while some friend of a friend of a friend with a US passport drove all our instruments and amps through a different crossing for 50 bucks, and we prayed that they wouldn't just decide to steal all of it. Also, for the first time, we had our very own white American man with us, the official tour manager on the official paperwork, plus all our gear proudly slotted into the back of the van like a heavy game of Tetris. Still, Sarita was tense as the men with guns flipped through her passport. We felt her uncoil after they waved us through and the low buildings of the checkpoint receded behind us. Welcome to America, ladies. <clears throat> Logan beat an enthusiastic drum roll on the back of Taylor's seat. We're going to absolutely murder this tour. You won't be the same band when it's over. I know it. We snickered a little bit at his earnestness. 
but the thrill of new connections and opportunities eclipsed our usual derision. Taylor smiled into the rear view, breaking into a full grin when Logan met her eyes and smiled back. Logan seemed tentatively to be a good guy or a fine guy, a passably thoughtful dude who, retreated, who retweeted the right accounts and commented on the right posts and frequently voiced his intentions to not take up too much space. For instance, he had recently joined the charge against multiple influential male figures in the Montreal music scene. A trickle of call-outs ranging from emotional manipulation to harassment to assault had led to a deluge. Logan had spearheaded an accountability process for a racialized female DJ and a white male booker who had refused to pay her performance fee after she turned down one of his many hookup proposals. There were receipts, but the process inevitably got messy and eventually everyone agreed it had to be abandoned. At least Logan had tried, we thought, taken a public stand, risked his growing reputation as a real player in the local hierarchy. It was more, far more than we could say of most of the men we knew. And now we were bringing him along on tour, hoping that he was serious about opening industry doors for us, about not disrupting our trinity. He was so adamant about his connections, how Hecate was the next big thing, just the right people hadn't heard about us yet. His confidence was infectious. When Logan had started messaging Taylor on Instagram six months ago, full of praise for a show we just played or offering to hook us up with a supporting slot on a major bill, she'd relayed the flirtier details to us with a hint of shame in her dark eyes, hedging a little, acting like she wasn't into it, but also clearly smitten. Taylor, we'd cautioned, are you considering getting involved with him? What if things get messy? Band comes first, right? Guys, come on, she'd said. I'm not stupid. I know how to navigate this. Plus, he's so cute. He just wants to support us. Nothing bad's going to happen here. We weren't sure exactly when they started dating, but from one day to the next, they melded. He moved in with her into her affordable plant-filled second floor apartment where she had always loved living alone. Not only did he come to all our shows, he helped us load in and out and even showed up at practice sometimes just to listen in. We were a little irked by this. None of us had dated men since we'd started the band. Sarita had never dated men at all. To make Taylor feel better, we joked that Logan was a wannabe lesbian. It's a classic U-Haul situation. Of course he picked Taylor, we thought. She was the most approachable of the three of us. Not a towering goddess like me, Sarita would say, or a shapely vixen, come moi, Magda would cry, shimmying around the jam space with her guitar strapped to her torso. Taylor was strikingly pretty, with long, thick hair, a delicate figure, the most reserved of us. Straight passing, we'd tease her, and she'd bristle. Queers never pay any attention to me, she lamented. Cis dudes are the only ones who do. You two don't have that problem. Okay, do you even know how many straight men send me thirsty DMs like daily? Sarita exclaimed. Tay, you're allowed to take the initiative, you know. Sometimes you need to exercise your agency. Yeah, added Magda. The gay agenda doesn't just spread itself. Taylor would shrug and nod, chastised. Then we would all swig our beers and launch back into the wall of feedback we had produced, like diving headfirst into an oncoming wave. When we finally accepted his repeated offers to manage us a month before tour, Logan was so excited that he posted about it immediately. Hashtag stoked to be officially managing the best queer band on either side of the border, heading out to make a name for ourselves. It feels good to be on the right side of history. This is what it means to be a man in the music industry now. Step back and hashtag support women musicians. It was a good look for him. His post went viral an example of how men could be real allies in the fight for change. He told us he was now fielding management requests from several other women-fronted projects. There was an article about him in a popular Montreal Weekly. I made sure Hakate was mentioned several times, he said. In the accompanying photo, taken after a show at everyone's favorite punk house near the canal, he's grinning into the camera, his delicate features brightly lit, while our three faces loom behind him, partly in shadow, our eyes gleaming, our mouths slightly open, like we were about to sing or scream. The first day on the road, we barely remembered he was there. 
After his initial burst of enthusiasm, he dozed in the back, limbs draped over Sarita's breakables. Nice, we thought, low maintenance. Taylor snuck glances at him in the rear view mirror, hoping to catch his eye again, but he pulled his cap over his face. She drove us down through Vermont, past lakes, through thick forest. The highway was smooth and the van seemed to glide along it frictionless. Now and then a liquid mirage glimmered on the back on the black top, appearing and disappearing in the heat. Her silver rings glinted in the light, her tapered fingers guiding the wheel. She fed us a steady stream of Alice Coltrane as we cracked the windows and squinted into the sun. The air smelled tangy and green. Strands of harp washed over us. We stuck our arms, then our heads out the windows, whooping through the humidity. Every so often, the white bottoms of deer flitted through the trees as we passed. Good omens, we thought, friendly energies. It was true that there had been a time back when we were pure and joyful in our gay POC punk militancy, when we would have said fuck no to Logan, would have told him to stick it, that he wasn't welcome on our tour, that we were DIY till we die, that queer brown sisterhood suffers no bros, that he was a hanger on who was taking up way too much of Taylor's time for our liking. But we are tired now, bone tired with the weight of the years, with the weight of waiting for validation, vindication, and now we just wanted that easy step up that every straight white band took without a second thought. Magda had pulled cards for us almost every day in the week leading up to departure. There was a distinct pattern to the spreads, the tower preceding judgment nearly every time, the chariot often in the future position, which meant upheaval, change, the end of a karmic cycle, definitive action, travel to, we had struggled in the local show circuit for years, getting passed over, underestimated, harassed, insulted, and worse. We had a reputation for being hard to work with, which is what people say when you call bullshit instead of eating it. But that whole rotten scene was now eating itself, and we were about to step into the power that was meant for us. I'm gonna stop there. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, that story goes on for quite a lot longer. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand it over to Cal now, who is going to read, I think, one or two excerpts from his new book, A Natural History of Transition. Transition. Sorry. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good. I'm unmuted. Uh, I read the rest of that story this morning. So when Helen's book comes out later this year, it's called Personal Attention Role Play. Um, you all are going to be in for a treat. My husband and I were screaming about it. Uh, we saw many, many uh, places and people that we are, were familiar to us through his uh, career as a touring musician, DIY musician oh, no way. in New England. <laughs> so it was really enjoyable. <laughs> Love that. Um, great. I'm so excited to hear what you have chosen for us. Um, I guess I'll mute myself and disappear for now, and then I'll come back when you're done and we'll have a chat. Sounds great. And right. uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Metonymy, for putting out uh, A Natural History of Transition and for putting this event together and just for being wonderful to work with. Um, I'm gonna read uh, an excerpt from a short story called Moon Snail. And then I'm going to read another excerpt from the title story called A Natural History of Transition. Um, and I'm gonna start my timer. And then after that, Helen and I will talk for a little while. Uh, Moon Snail begins with an epigraph. Science is continually busy with the complete description of something, with ultimately the complete description of anything, with ultimately the complete description of everything. Gertrude Stein. Getting out of the boat was transom. She perched and swung there, balanced on a wave, while her classmates watched which way the hinge would swing, up in the air, light as a turn, or down to the sea. A fracturing of light and cold and wet held close to the skin by petticoats. A breaking of camaraderie as the man tried not to laugh, tried to hoist her from the shallow divot in the rocks where she sometime might have liked to stay among the ane anemone mussels and crabs, filled and emptied twice a day at the moon's insistence, like her hopes for what she'd see in the viewfinder. Microscopic streamers, embryos smothered under glass, or just a lot of cloudy nothing 
which only looked like nothing until a twist of knob crystallized all the unnamed swimmery spinners that occupy a vacant space. Inside the lab is where things unbend and show off. At first, she, she thought she knew the story of birth. Now she realizes how much more there is than blood and cry and doubling. There's the whole before and after, before the bee leaps into being, the quiet, energetic egg, translucent limbs in flux, fluttering ghosts of gestures they'll perform on land. In this place where they are at the start of taking the start so seriously, she hadn't expected to be telling a new story each day about life and death and sense and understanding. She wanted to slow down and think more about keratin, limestone, calcium, break it all down piece by piece like a moon snail, drilling a hole in the shell of a smaller snail and flooding it with caustic juices before slurping it all out. She would like to do that to the world around her, liquefy until it bleeds together. She walks the path of the Nautilus exploring its shell through winding streets to the boarding house, always stopping off at the beach. She marvels at the shell, the three by three by three of it, the perfectly stacked whorls one on top of the other like china plates on a sideboard. She wants to be inside of its geometry, part of its perfect equation. She can't get inside the embryo sandwiched between strips of glass, but maybe if she thinks hard enough, she can shrink her thoughts to fit, concentrate them like little cubes of bullion, condensed so more potent. She would keep them that way all the time to have something sharp about her even when she leaves the shell, something to resist digestion. Morning, creak of borders, women all around her. Most waiting for beloveds out at sea or visiting their scientist fiancés. Lying in bed, she waits till they've all left. She does not enjoy small talk about husband's grand discoveries, which are nothing more than routine experiments made gigantic by man talk. Men magnified everything. Certain women ate it up. She rises, puts up her hair and dresses, smiles to find a breakfast warm and wrapped for her by the landlady, whom she rarely sees whom she rarely sees, but they understand one another. Salt did that to a woman, she thinks. It's going, it's doing it to me. She looked forward to being slowly desiccated by the sea. Take me down to salt cod, she thinks. Make me a thin crust of mineral on the rocks, tenacious, bitter, but necessary for life. She found herself using the lab's way of looking on other things, light, silverware, the drape of a dress, fallen down barns, a poet makes science out of everything the scientist ignores. She tries opening her viewfinder wider, found she could make a study of the folds of fabric in a skirt, the slatted fences, the slots left open, the kettle's curve. She grasped the space between the words of fisherman's speech, the rocking boats, how frightening the amount she could miss. Once in a while, she'd be waiting her turn at the nets or on the beach alone, and everything would stick, slow down to freezing, and then come unglued. So easy to separate things from what made them separate, from what made separate thingness desirable. All could be strung along the necklace of thingness, an abacus of those and thises. That's the end of that excerpt that I'll read from Moon Snail. Um, if the epigraph doesn't give it away, that story is based on Gertrude Stein's year that she spent studying embryology at the Woods Hole uh, Marine Biological Lab in 1893. Three, I think it was. Um, and now, though, I'm going to read a bit from a very different kind of story. Uh, like I said, this is the title story. This is A Natural History of Transition. Um, and I'm going to start kind of in the middle of the story. Um, and all you really need to know here is that the narrator, who is unnamed, um, has returned back to his hometown a small town called Catania. And he is a trans man um, and he hasn't been back in about 15 years, but his uncle has passed away and his uncle left him a natural history museum, um, which has he's now seen once and it has some strange different kinds of specimens that he's not quite sure what they are yet. He hasn't been able to identify them. Um, and I think that's all you need to know. Uh, this scene I'm gonna read from and then uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and read from one more scene. But this one picks up in a, uh, the funeral, the wake for his uncle, Wayne.
I found myself standing outside McCarthy's funeral home in a borrowed suit. McCarthy's used to be a family style restaurant where we went after soccer games and recitals. They served dinner rolls the size of your head that everyone fought over. I assume the same family didn't specialize in banquet seating and the mortuary arts. So I guess they kept the name for recognition. From the outside, however, the building looked the same. The program out front with Uncle Wayne's details could have been mistaken for a menu. When someone kills themselves in Catania, it's different than a suicide in the city. Everyone either knew that person or knew of that person, and it's an affront to subtract oneself from such a small community. Everyone takes it personally. Everyone wants to know how it happened, but nobody wants to be caught wondering. It's fertile ground for flea markets, estate sales, anything where someone might walk idly through the possessions of the dead, hunting for clues at a bargain that might yield hints of the desperation that once held them. Everyone wants a piece of their tragedy. But when I stepped inside, there was no humiliating rush of sympathy or speculation as to how I'd grown a beard and whether I'd grown other things too, because no one recognized me. Being incognito, I could nod stoically at passersby while observing the ritual. The card outside announced that the wake was open casket, which surprised me given the nature of Wayne's hunting accident. A lot of people cycled through the room, paying their respects, and it dawned on me that my uncle had grown into a man of some influence in Catania, thanks to his unusual curatorial practice. I recognized almost all of my middle and high school science teachers, though I couldn't remember their names. Looking worn out from thankless years of Scantron tests and microscope primers, a monotony no doubt broken by field trips to the Catania Museum of Natural History. There were other minor characters too. A taut and sinewy former running coach who somehow looked younger in his baggy suit. One middle-aged blonde woman with the springy look of a former babysitter, especially in the dimpled scar on her lip where I seem to remember the glint of a piercing. Several young men looked more bereft at the loss of their caps than because of the official occasion. And it was a shock to see some of my most despised bullies from grade school looking clean shaven, muscular, and not unattractive in their shirt sleeves, a physique roughed out from years lugging drain pipe and 50 pound sacks of grain. Becky from the Valero was there standing close to a stout woman with a crew cut. Even the mayor was in attendance, dourly gripping a plate of crudité Back when I'd known him, he was a senior snorting whippets in the back seat of his girlfriend's car during study hall. I drifted along unnoticed in the receiving line until I arrived in front of Wayne, laid out where the salad bar used to be. They'd done a good job. Someone had gone to the trouble of feathering his shoulder length brown gray hair, styling him like he might've done himself 40 years ago. With the undertaker's smear of rouge, he looked like he did the time he took me out on his snowmobile one Christmas evening, when my parents had been in a row all day over particulars of the meal. He sat me in front and we coasted the snowy waves of the fields lit up like mother of pearl. We weren't physically a very intimate family. And so the memory of falling asleep against my uncle's chest, the thrum of diesel underneath us sticks out in my memory as a moment of tenderness. I put one hand over Wayne's cold fingers folded demurely over his gut. I was obscured by dark suits engaged in conversation on both sides. And so I didn't think anyone would notice the gesture. Just before pulling away, I felt something attached to the meat of his palm below the pinky joint. It dislodged from his hand with very little effort like an unwanted skin tag. Only it wasn't skin, but a very tiny form like the ones I'd seen in the sliding drawers of his museum. This one was about the size of my fingernail, with half of its surface covered in a soft, dun-colored fur. I was trying to study the object surreptitiously. I must have looked overcome with grief, staring into my cupped hands as I was, when a movement in my peripheral vision caught my attention. Where his jaw faded into the chicken skin of his throat was a dark crease that looked like a faded tattoo, but I'd never known Wayne to have any ink. Then with a flutter of its lid, the tattoo blinked, and I saw it wasn't ink, but an eye that looked pretty pissed off actually at the sight of me seeing it. Not knowing what I was looking at, I reeled back and straight into the outstretched arm of my father. Full of adrenaline, I felt more prepared than I would have expected. John looked composed, slightly heavier than I remembered, 
better filling out the suit I recalled from the weddings and funerals of my childhood. My heart hammered. I stole a glance back at Wayne's neck eye, but it was closed now and back to looking like just another sad fold of skin on a dead man. I can't believe he ended up like this. Just the other day, we were out at the blind, not hunting, just drinking and shooting the shit. My father was that rare, true mourner. He laid one heavy arm around my shoulder while he reminisced. I stiffened. It had been longer than the 15 years I'd been gone since we'd touched in this way. As we stood there, me listening, him talking, he reminded me of a deflated balloon, one that used to be very scary, like those Macy's Thanksgiving parade monstrosities. And now I saw that he was losing air. So what are you doing now? He finally asked. The longer we stood, the longer people stared. They remembered, of course, that John had had a daughter a long time ago. Now they took a second look at my eyes, the same shape as John's eyes, the whirl in his hair, sparse, but the same pattern as mine, all resemblances that were new and surprising to me, but features which his neighbors were all well accustomed to meeting in the grocery store. And I could feel them adding it all up with the way my hips bulged slightly over Tim's narrow waistband and my cuffed sleeves and the way that other me, the girl one, had never come back to town. A few people milled behind John, drifting into my line of sight to get a better look. I came because Wayne left me the museum. I put my hand in my pocket, still clutching the tiny form I'd plucked from my uncle. He nodded. I was a little surprised. He never mentioned to me that you, you two were still close. But what do I want with his moldy old museum? Will you junk the lot of it? I was getting distracted trying to avoid the stare of a boy I'd slept with in high school, but couldn't remember the name of. There were several of them there, in fact, who, unlike Tim, were only interested in the sex. This made them quite a lot like me as a girl, actually, one who wanted to test run her body and troubleshoot its strange mix of desire and self-repulsion. That had been the end of Tim and me, ultimately. I'd used him as more of an experiment in sexual attraction to work out the bugs of my body than as a true partner. But Tim wasn't there, so I was left with these semi-familiar automatons looking at me. There were others too, like Dr. Delphi, who'd seen my girl body mature right in front of him and never mentioned that there was an alternative to cutting red lines into my shins and wanting to claw myself inside out. The doctor was the one who recognized me first and he approached with an outstretched hand and a smile far too large for a funeral. I heard you were back in town, blank. And I'll be honest, I was hoping you'd be here so I could see how you turned out. Professional curiosity. His skin was clammy, unsettling for a medical professional whose skin should always be warm and chapped from copious amounts of sanitizer. And he had used my dead name. Were I a bolder person who cared less about how I appeared in public, I would have turned in a circle for dramatic effect and invited more onlookers to inspect my grand transformation like a P.T. Barnum who'd slipped inside one of his own freak shows. More than once I'd imagined what it would be like to move back to my hometown, how I would manage to live side by side with the past version of me, traversing all the same roads and trails that I used to walk just inside a different body. How the extremely cheap rent would allow me to open a queer bookstore on Main Street and how I would decorate my front yard with the oversized crystal mosaic dildos I coveted in the window of a Portland curio shop. I had no illusions that I was the only queer or even trans person who was from or lived in that town. And I imagined how we would go about finding each other, how lightly they would tread on my welcome mat after seeing the little flag out front, perhaps after a particularly traumatic appointment with the doctor himself. My daydream was interrupted by my phone ringing loudly from my pocket. I looked up at Dr. Delphi, who still waited for my response. Excuse me, I have to take this. I rushed out of the room and down a set of stairs to a landing where I exhaled a shaky laugh and stared at the ringing phone in my hand. You were a little late, I answered. Before going into the wake, I'd texted Jack to call me in 20 minutes so that I would have a plausible excuse to jettison myself in case things got weird. I know, I'm sorry. I was just finishing my shift and going to call you when Brad stopped me and asked. Almost every job Jack had worked had included a coworker by the name of Brad or Chad or something similar, and he'd taken up a routine of talking to me about their boneheadedness. While Jack talked, I fished out of my pocket the strange object I'd plucked from my uncle's body. I could touch it and roll it around between my fingers. It was real. And then there was the eye, of course. I'd seen it. 
it had seen me seeing it. I was getting a little freaked out, but I didn't know how to explain this to Jack. Hello, are you there? Yeah, yes, sorry. No, I'm sorry. You're at your uncle's funeral and I'm just talking about my day. I'm a jerk. How is it? Did your mom go? No, but John's here. He was nice. He was trying to be nice. Motherfucker. There's something else going on that I don't know how to explain. I held the object up to the light, but it was opaque. It smelled like nothing. I couldn't bring myself to taste it. The part that had been attached to his cold skin was a level plane where I had separated it from its host, if that's what he had been. To hold something and stay in a state of unknowing for so long arouses both fondness and dread. I felt a sense of responsibility and ownership over the unnameable object, but I also felt its weight pressing down on me, putting pressure on my notion of a name and selfhood until I knew I'd either have to fling it away, bury it deep underground, or figure out what to call it. But my vocabulary had run dry. I didn't know at the time if the shapes had come from my uncle or had attached themselves to him, like burrs. I slipped it back in my pocket and told Jack that I was okay, or I would be anyway. I just needed to take care of Wayne's museum, and then I'd be home. Um, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. We have kind of about 20 minutes left for all the rest of our talking. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, Zoom ambush you like that. Oh, no, it's okay. It it's seemed been... like you were done. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your reading. Um, and congratulations on publishing your first book. It's, uh, it's an exciting thing, right? Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I guess we will move into our conversation and um, thank you again for every, to everyone for being here and uh, a reminder that if you would like closed captioning, there's an option to toggle that on. Um, most likely at the bottom of your screen to the right, there's a little CC sign and apparently sometimes it could be up top, but um, yes, that's an option. Um, Cal, I, um, I love this collection so much. Um, I read it really fast because it was very exciting to read. Uh, I'm always on the lookout for, you know, queer and trans fiction, especially short fiction, because I'm a huge short fiction fan as well as a short fiction writer. Um, and, you know, collections like that, 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 that surprise me and catch me mm -hmm. off guard. Um, and especially collections and writing that don't, don't endeavor to explain too much. Um, and I think that your book really has all of those elements. So it was a real joy to read it. Thank you. Um, I guess like a good opening question is, um, I'm always curious about how other people put their short story collections together. Um, so I'm curious about how this collection came together for you. You know, did you have the idea of writing towards a collection from the beginning? Did you write stories to fit into a particular concept or did the collection arise a bit more organically as you went? Yeah, um, this collection was definitely in the organic camp. Um, I was sort of writing, this was not the first book I thought I was gonna put out, but while I was trying to get another book that was actually a novel published, I was writing these stories in the background. Um, and when eventually I kind of gave up on that previous project, I knew that I had all this stuff together and never thought of it as being together in a book before, but thought that there was something I was trying to do with nature writing and writing about animals and places and trans characters all together. Um, and I thought maybe that these stories together in a book would be a good sort of first, first draft of those, some of these ideas that I'm, and themes that I'm working with in here. Um, and so I, I wrote these stories over the course of about three to four years. Um, and you finished in 2019 and, uh, Matani was the, the first place I went to and, um, thankfully they, they wanted to put it out. A good match. Um, I, yeah, I guess, you know, from the title, the title has some clues as to what the general themes of collection are. 
a little, I, again, like I said, it's the collection is very surprising, so it certainly doesn't give everything away. Um, but uh, yeah, so of course it would be clear to anybody that there are concepts of like nature and like the historical conceptions of nature, as well as of course transition that are central preoccupations for you. I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about these different threads and like the impetus that drove you, you know, to write these particular stories within these this particular um, space of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, originally, I think a good place to start is kind of the title itself, like you bring up, um, mm -hmm. it is definitely intentionally riffing on sort of field guides or old books sort of about nature or that purport to identify uh, different species or um, to lay out the history of one organism chronologically. Uh, as if that could kind of give us some kind of insight or knowledge uh, beyond what we can glean from talking to others or from interacting with that animal or species. And so originally I wanted that title for a nonfiction project and I, I gave up on that pretty quickly because I didn't really like the direction it was going with the idea that trans people and transition uh, Show, shows up in nature and so therefore it's natural. That wasn't something that was interesting or I wasn't interested in kind of furthering that uh, idea because I think being trans and transition is a very wonderfully human thing to do and, and choice to make um, and, and has as much related to art and uh, as it does to nature. And so I think a lot of these stories try to play with that, recombine different uh, archetypes or myths of transformation uh, in different ways. Like the first story, which is in kind, which in which a trans man gives birth to a, a cocoon um, that never actually hatches in the story. Um, and so I like the idea of kind of putting all these different elements of transition and metamorphosis together and digesting them and reconstituting them and seeing what comes out of that. Uh, the idea that this you know trans person would give birth to simply more change, I think was interesting to me to see where that would end up going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, right, there's this sense of transition is not like a thing that can be told in a linear historical way. Um, and I think that, that that idea kind of shows up even just in the structure of your stories. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm happy that you chose to read from The Moon's Tale and then the titular story because uh, I find those two stories do a good job of showing how much range you have. And that range is apparent throughout the whole collection and made it like extra fun to read. I just never knew like what tone of story I was going to land on next. Um, so I found that both of those stories in different ways sort of set up a certain narrative expectation and then break the narrative expectation. Uh, the moon snail is rooted in like scientific observation and description um, and, and also like the, the true life of, of a person uh, in history. Uh, and I think we think we often think of these things as being very linear, like science is like obser observing things and then drawing conclusions, and it's all so linear. I mean, not really, but uh, anyway. And and this, but the story itself is very dreamlike and very rich in sensory detail, almost almost prose poemy. It's like a series of impressions, and I felt like every sentence in that story is just like perfect. I really I really liked it a lot. Um, and then on the other hand, a natural history of transition appears at first to have like a classic narrative arc, you know, we think that, oh, okay, it's a trans protagonist who's returning to his childhood small town, nervous about how he's going to be perceived after so many years away, like, um, is he going to reconnect with his father, things like this, but in, I found it's, I don't know if you meant it as like a joke per se, but in this case, it's funny because the situation, and I won't give spoilers beyond what you sort of revealed in your reading, but the situation, capital S, that the townspeople are dealing with is like so extreme that in fact, uh, the main character is being trans is really not the main focus of the story in the end. Um, so yeah, I feel like uh, you're really good at narrative misdirection 
if I can call it that. Um, I wonder if you can like speak to that. Is it something that you do on purpose? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's something I do to myself on purpose. Um, I, mm -hmm. I have never been a, a writer who can have an idea for a plot or a story and then successfully execute that to its mm -hmm. end. Um, it just usually ends up falling pretty flat. And so, um, I will write without really knowing what's going to happen. And that sense of kind of misdirection usually I think comes from, you know, starting out in a certain place and not knowing where I'm going to end up. And so usually the story that I begin writing is very different from what ends up being actually on the page. Um, but I think also, you know, writing stories about trans characters isn't a, a new thing at this point. Like there are many trans writers out there writing wonder, making wonderful work. And um, you, you even said it yourself too, like the, for a natural history of transition, it seems at first, like it's going to be a traditional trans narrative arc, which, you know, maybe not everybody knows what that is, but certainly anybody who's a trans writer recognizes what that arc is uh, of, you know, coming back home, being accepted, or having conflicted feelings about being accepted or recognized, or am I passing or am I not passing? And um, so I think, you know, I, I think in the last, I don't think I'm the first person to like mess with these ideas of, of trans narratives in that way. I think in the last like five years or so, most trans writers who are writing fiction or or doing interesting things with genre or hybrid forms are, are messing with this in really interesting ways. Um, and so I think I'm just trying to continue in that tradition. And especially with this first book of stories, like my next, the stuff I'm working on now is more nonfiction than fiction. So I think as I move between like different genres, it will probably continue to, to evolve. And um, as far as like, if misdirection like queers fiction in that way, I also think that, you know, it's not just queer writers who, who use misdirection um, or, or kind of different change, change up the mode of storytelling or whatever it is in, in the middle of um, a piece. So I don't know if I would say that, but I do think that trans writers in kind of telling these not cisnormative stories of their lives have a unique opportunity to kind of like mix up all the different slides of a story, if you will. Uh, and, and when telling something new and different. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely there are writers who are part of various diasporas who would, sim you know, are similarly um, kind of turning the sort of classic like diasporic return story or things like immigration stories on their heads in, in interesting ways, um, for sure. Um, I think I'm still kind of like fixated on this idea of like, misdirection and I want to talk a little bit more about like um the way that you write shifting states in your stories like beyond like you know classic or non-classic trans narratives um a lot of your stories you know shift kind of constantly between states of gender um states of time and place and sometimes also just like states of being human and then maybe being non-human or beyond human um I was a little reminded of one of my all-time favorite short story writers, Julio Cortázar, the Argentinian, who to me is like one of the masters of the both sudden yet almost imperceptible shift within a story. And it's like, you're there. And then, you know, three words later, you're somewhere totally different. But as a reader, it's very hard to quite put your finger on when the change happened. Um, it's something that I'm like, a little bit obsessed with trying to achieve in my own work. Um, and so I was excited to read your stories because I think that you often do it really well. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about like how you approach these types of shifts in your work. And you already spoke to this a little bit that you, you're not necessarily someone who like plots out your stories really specifically, but I'm wondering if you maybe begin with like some notion of a shift, maybe right towards it and then away from it, or does it just surprise you? as you're going? Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting question. And, and I like talking about stories on this like craft level too, like how do you get that shift uh, to happen? Especially because it's hard to even name like what the shift is. Like it's not a very technical term, right? It's like kind of nebulous. Um, but I think even though I don't um, 
plot out stories, I will often give myself a restraint and saying, okay, I, I have this story about like a, a trans man doing X, Y, Z or whatever, um, or a woman turning into a mountain and then the moon and one of the other stories. And I wanna see if I can do that in say 15 pages or, mm. or say, I wanna see if I can do it in four pages or I wanna see if I can do it in 50 pages and like how that changes the story. Um, is where I get a lot of energy from from doing or while I'm writing, thinking about how you know certain scenes would expand or contract or how to get from point A to point B. And I think a lot of those shifts come from that. Um, and I I because I usually set that kind of constraint and like have that in the back of my head as something that is weighing on me. I think um, most of my stories I won't often do a lot of like big cutting uh, normally because it is, there is like a narrative tension that I think is kind of baked into some of them in order for that, the action to kind of unfold and things to happen uh, getting towards the end. So I think that's probably where it comes from. Um, and I mean, your comparison is very generous. I don't know if I, I will stack up to Cortazar, but uh, uh, I, I appreciate you saying that, that's very kind. Yeah, I think it's fun to hear certain echoes in different people's mm -hmm. writing. And it's something um, we see a lot in like uh, different Latin American writers too, right? So the, that shift, I think, and, and magical realism and all of that uh, yeah. is something that I'm really inspired by. Yeah, same. Um, I find that, I think I said this already, I really, I think you write the sensory details of nature in a very engrossing way. Um, and it, it, it's especially powerful in combination with how you write about, you know, shifting gender and shifting bodies. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how you write about these things um, in relation to climate change, um, which is, is an undercurrent in a bunch of the stories. And I think, yeah, I would say is like probably like the most obvious in the story called Migration, um, in which two characters, the couple have a pretty massively different responses to the onslaught of climate change. We're like in a slightly, you know, a near a near future Massachusetts um, where the weather change is becoming more and more obvious. Um, and uh, yeah, it seems like the characters' responses to this climate disaster um, are linked to how each character views themselves and their sort of gender and body in that certain moment. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk, I don't know if you want to talk about that story a little bit, um, or if you could just talk more generally about, yeah, about kind of like writing the ongoing climate disaster into stories that are about people and, and nature. Yeah, I, I think so far, like, like you say, it, it shows up in a lot of my stories, but it's not usually the like main thing that's driving the action. Um, and I think, in a way that's kind of also what it's like in, in real life sometimes yeah. too. Like it's always there, it's always around us. We are very clearly like living in this massive change of in transition of weather and seasons and weather becoming more sporadic. And I, I see a lot of, I mean, in my life personally, the two biggest changes that have affected me have been my transition and also climate change. And so I think about them a lot of the time in the same breath. Uh, and I, I think, you know, it, it, these are ideas that I'm still kind of working out, but I think that they both have something to do with the fact that there are these categories that we have held on to for so long, I, at least in the West, about ideas about gender, um, masculinity and femininity, categories of gender identity, and then also categories of seasons and weather and the stories of, that we tell about these things. And now they're kind of breaking down. And in some ways that's great because there's a lot more freedom in terms of uh, gender expression, gender identity and being accepted in those ways. Uh, but there are people around the world who think that's a bad thing, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of fear and anxiety that's been stirred up around the breaking down of those categories, both of weather, seasons, tradition, uh, easily predictable things like that, and also gender, um, easily predictable categories of, of gender. And so 
that's that's a lot of what I'm writing about right now. And I do think it shows up in that story um, migration as well, because like you said, there's the two characters, the one who is a trans man um, finds a little bit more companionship with things like certain invasive species, things that aren't supposed to thrive, but do because now the time, the time or the weather, I suppose, is finally ripe, which is the last line of that story. Um, so I think there's a kind of like guilty pleasure-ness in that, in that character um, to be identifying with these kinds of things these maybe not supposed to be. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm still exploring a lot of that. I, I don't think I have a like super clearly articulated idea of what it's doing in my fiction yet, but in nonfiction, I'm, I'm trying to get there. Yeah, I feel like fiction can be a place where we can ask some of those questions without having definitive answers, you know, mm -hmm. through the characters that we write, uh, the conversations that they have and the things that they do, you know, even and maybe especially if they are not behaving or speaking in the ways that like we would as, you know, ourselves. <laughs> yeah. um, or that we would maybe wouldn't want to or dare to or whatever. Um, I, I think too, there's like, um, I just read a piece recently, it's by a writer named Nar Gavin about climate grief and where it shows up in climate fiction and how it sometimes takes on this like navel gazing aspect uh, in, in the, I know we're closing in on time here, so I, I don't wanna go on too long. But, um, and we might go a few minutes over, but if anyone needs to, to leave, that's fine too. Um, but, uh, so I, I think that's really interesting, the idea that like climate fiction is trying to inspire empathy in us and emotion in us and motion toward uh, changing our attitudes, supposedly, right? And our actions so that we will help fix the world. But I think there's a growing skepticism that that's actually what it is doing um, or yeah. that if like fiction is capable of doing that uh, which I think is is fascinating yeah I guess maybe we should I had a few more questions I see there's one question that's in the Q&A and I definitely want to get to that um, maybe I can ask you one more quick yeah. question. And then uh, also uh, just a reminder to participants that if you would like to ask a question of Cal, um, you can type it into the, the, the Q and A area. Um, so far we have, I can see one question from David, which we'll get to. Um, yeah, just quickly, I had, I had seen, uh, I think it was Brandon Taylor, the American writer who tweeted something recently along the lines of like, most people read fiction as if it's an ethics handbook and criticize it as such. Um, and, uh, and, you know, sort of talking about how that's a bit of a, an issue or a shortcoming in sort of like literary criticism and just like the reception of fiction in general. Um, so I, as we've sort of said, like, or I can be a bit more explicit, like some of your characters are, are morally ambiguous, just like real people are. Um, there's a story called Winter of Men, which we haven't talked about, but it, it reimagines the congregation of Marguerite Bourgeois um, in the 17th century in Ville-Marie. Uh, and, and it includes, you know, some of her violent treatment of indigenous women um, in the story. Uh, and, uh, she's not the protagonist, but the protagonist is sort of like, you could say complicit in, in some ways. Anyway, I don't wanna give away too much, but I'm just interested in like your approach to writing morally dubious characters. I think that it reflects the world, but sometimes when I'm writing, I feel a bit of a, a panic or like an invisible pressure to not write anything that I couldn't stand behind, even though to me, it's clear that it's like a character and not um, somebody who's a stand-in for myself. Yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely something that I um, try to explore in a lot of my stories. I think I was wrestling with it for a long time about like what to do to write these types of characters, especially as a white writer, you know, mm -hmm. and, and wanting to write about terrible things that have been done by, by white people and, and settlers in this, this country and, and Canada, both countries really. Um, yeah. And, you know, 
I, when I, a few years ago, when I was still in the MFA, I, I picked up this book. It's The Racial Imaginary that uh, Claudia Rankin co edited with um, Beth Lafreda and Max Kingcap. Um, and the introduction to that has been a really important uh, kind of lodestar for me because they ask, um, you know, in, and, and I think in a way, they're not just speaking to white writers. This is a very, like, there are many writers who contribute to this anthology and, and talking about struggles with this. But I, for me, as a white writer, it really resonated when they asked, okay, if you want to write this story about, say, you know, uh, indigenous communities in 1600s Montreal at the time of contact, right, with when a lot of colonists are coming over, ask yourself, like, why you want to write that as a white writer and like what is it about that that makes it feel important for you to write and then write about that instead about that imperative that feeling of oh I must tell this story that isn't mine necessarily to mm -hmm. tell um, and have that be the engine behind whatever story will come out of that um, and so that's kind of what I have used to steer my own moral compass, I guess, in writing morally ambiguous characters. And I think also, I, I, I love Brandon's quote um, that you read, I, and I think he's totally, you know, right in that. Uh, and, but it's not necessarily the fault of the readers. I mean, the publicity machine behind mainstream fiction on the, so many book flaps, you will read this book expands empathy or, you know, will bring you to a greater understanding of XYZ people are more compassion. And I mean, I, I, I have worked as a publicist and so I understand like the, the crunch of a deadline, but I think it's unrealistic to imagine that fiction can do all of these things. And also, even if it could, there are many faster ways to build empathy than you know writing and then publishing a book, which takes many years uh, of solitary work and can be very isolating <laughs> at the same time. So I, I don't know that it's necessarily um, the work of a book to be able to do that. Yeah, I'm, I mostly hope that it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Okay, so I will we'll get to David's question. Maybe I'll, I'll read David's question out and you can respond to it. Um, so David says, uh, Helen describes moon, the moon snail as prose poemy, and there is an obvious attention to syntax and the sonic qualities of the sentence. Do you have a background in or have you studied poetry? I studied a little poetry in my MFA and in college, and originally when I was much younger, I was thinking of myself more as a poet, but I think these days I've become kind of what happens when a poet tries to become a scientist and then tries to become a fiction writer instead. Um, because while, while I was in undergrad, I was majoring in the sciences and sort of thought that's what I was going to be doing, which I think is kind of evident in a lot of my work. But, but then once I realized I didn't really want to do that, and then I also realized that you could perform a similar kind of study of things and emotions and people and close looking through literature and through fiction that was when I realized I could kind of channel that sort of close attention to detail uh, that I found in both poetry and science through a different medium altogether. Um, and I think that's why uh, Gertrude Stein's kind of background that I didn't know about before I sort of decided to write this story um, was interesting to me. And I, I wanted to kind of walk that line of, of emulating but not too closely her language um, because I will never be Stein obviously and have no illusions about that. But I did want to capture some of the like breaking down of language that can happen in both poetry and a lab setting um, in, in that story and, and something that she might've experienced or been inspired by, I think by that. Cause I think it, that kind of looking doesn't leave her work. Uh, or, or it stays with her work, you know, in the years after she decides to abandon science too. There's actually a bit of a tie into what we were talking about with regards to Gertrude Stein and ambiguous morality. Uh, I, I started listening to this podcast called Bad Gays, um, uh -huh. where they, they like feature like a bad gay every 
every episode and I saw there's a Gertrude Stein episode which I'm excited to listen to cool. um, <laughs> that sounds great um okay so I guess I don't see any other questions in the Q&A thank you David for asking that one um I guess are there any other things you'd like to share about about your book Cal before we wrap up I guess uh, no, just that this has been great. Um, thank you, Helen, for asking such wonderful questions. I really enjoyed getting to answer them. Um, thank you, everyone who is here listening. Thank you. And this is the Montreal event. So thank you, anyone who's here from Montreal for putting up with my North Country accent and pronouncing various French words or phrases. Um, if they came up, maybe that's more in other stories, but I appreciate that as well. Um, and just thank you. And, uh, you know, I hope to hear from anybody who reads this book. I'd love to talk to you. Um, send me an email, write me a message. Um, and thank you to Blue Met for, for hosting us. Thanks, both of you, for that, those great readings and um, really fascinating conversation. Um, I want to thank, uh, once again, all of the attendees for being here um, to celebrate the launch of this book. I forgot to hold it up earlier. Um, and uh, I'm glad everybody got to hear um, a part of uh, Helen's forthcoming collection as well. Um, do stay tuned for an announcement this coming week about how to pre-order personal attention role play. Um, and I do encourage people to uh, pick up uh, Cal's book and Helen's book eventually, uh, either from our <laughs> web store, which is um, available through metonymypress.com or really any um, indie bookstore you want. To, if they have it, great. If they don't, ask them to order it. Pretty easy to do so. Uh, please do support your independent bookstores. Um, thank you, Blue Metropolis, for co-hosting this event with us. Um, I'm sure there are other things that I'm supposed to mention. Thank you, Kay, once again, for the live captioning. Um, if it's your first time watching an event being captioned live, I hope you were as amazed as I was when I see that happen. Um, it's an incredible skill. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, that's the last thing I was going to say. This is the first of a few events on Cal's a virtual tour. Um, so you can check out our event page or calangus.com, his event page. We've got two uh, events happening next week online, one with Andrea Lawler and one with Tori Peters. And then the following week, um, an event that has been hosted by Massey Art Society uh, in Vancouver um, with Corrine Manning and Hazel Jane Plant, another metonymy author. So um, I believe that's it. Thank you all for being here. Uh, apologies that we couldn't connect to Facebook, but we, as I said, it was recording. So it will uh, be available afterwards um, if you want to rewatch the readings, the fascinating conversation, if you want to share it with other people who weren't able to be here. So thanks again. Thanks, Cal. Thanks, Helen. And thanks to all of you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank, Thank you. you. Congrats, Cal. Thank Bye. you, Helen. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.